Good afternoon, everyone. It is Thursday, August the 6th, and it is now noon. And uh, in a moment, we'll begin our Bible study, um, giving you an opportunity right now to go ahead and uh, grab all of those items that you'll need uh, for the bag lunch Bible study. Of course, uh, make sure that uh, you have your lunch and whatever you're going to drink. Um, and of course, you can uh, get your Bible and whatever study aids you'll be using, paper, pens. Um, oh, my coffee cup is empty. Okay, well, I guess I won't be having any coffee for lunch today. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you go ahead and get ready. And uh, we'll begin momentarily. I want to give everybody an opportunity to uh, log on and to get uh, settled before we start. But I don't want to wait too long uh, because I know that all of us have things that we have to get done today. Um, and one of them being eating lunch. And while we're eating lunch, we're also going to study uh, God's word. I uh, hope that you're having a good day. Hope that the weather is good for you. We're having great weather here in Citrus County. Um, hot weather. It's been hot. Uh, crazy weather where we've not necessarily been having heat advisories. Um, but like yesterday, I think uh, the weather uh, reported that the weather was like 97 degrees outside, but it felt like 106. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that. It, it could be worse. We could have worse weather, um, but uh, we'll be happy. I'm happy for for the for the hot weather uh, because before too long, it'll be cold outside and um, people will be complaining about that as well. It is about two after 12. Want to give folks a couple more minutes to get online before we start. Um, Let's see, I need to change a setting here, I think. Okay, see if this uh, helps me a little bit. Um, my second week at flying solo in Bible study. Um, so we'll see what happens today. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. It looks like the microphone is on and... Uh, Video is playing, so we should be good. Uh, we'll wait just another minute or two, giving folks an opportunity to log on before we um, begin the Bible study. Uh, so go ahead and uh, get settled, get everything you need. We've still got oh, maybe two minutes. I'll start maybe about five after uh, with the Bible study. Uh, so you have still a few moments to, to get your lunch ready. Uh, finish cutting that sandwich or taking something out of the microwave or uh, whatever you're having for lunch today, you get that ready, get your drink, um, and uh, we'll start in just another couple of minutes. I have 12.03, so we'll wait till 12.05. Um, still waiting for uh, the five after, and then we will begin the Bible study. Reminds me of the song, Silence is Golden. But probably not on a live Bible study. People will probably be wondering, what happened to the sound? Why can't I hear anything? Sound is on. I'm talking. Things are good. And we're going to begin in just a moment with our Bible study. Um, we'll tell you that um, you might want to share with folks that you know that we are also uploading um, our Bible study and our Sunday worship um, to YouTube, to our YouTube channel, The Salvation Army Citrus County. Uh, when you go to YouTube and you uh, type in our, our name, you have to type the word The Salvation Army, The. Um, if you type in Salvation Army Citrus County, it won't pop up. The word The is very important. 
um, in the YouTube channel title. So uh, in a few days, um, well, I'll have it uploaded mo shortly after uh, we finish here today. But uh, you can share with folks uh, who may not have a Facebook account that they can also view it on YouTube, the Salvation Army Citrus County. Uh, that is a video upload and not a live uh, channel. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, Jesus is telling the parable that we're listening to today while he's traveling to Jerusalem with his disciples. Um, and the disciples are expecting that when they get to Jerusalem, Jesus is going to um, display his power and he's going to set up his kingdom there in Jerusalem. But his real reason for going to Jerusalem was to die. Um, and the disciples needed to know that soon Jesus uh, would be leaving this world uh, so that he could set up a heavenly kingdom rather than an earthly kingdom. Um, and they also needed to know what Jesus expected of them, how Jesus expected them to spend their time while he was gone. And he also wanted them to know um, how they would be rewarded for their faithful service when he does return. You know, no one knows when Jesus is going to return. Um, scripture says that he's going to come quickly, um, that he's going to come like a thief in the night. He'll, he'll return at a time when no one is expecting him. Um, and, and you know, that, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there is this um, need for me to make certain that I use my time doing things that will influence in a positive way the kingdom of God. And, and even in my downtime, even in my leisure, I don't want to do or to say or to act in a way that would detract from my Christian witness and reflect poorly on the kingdom. So while we're waiting for Christ's return, we are called as Christians to share Jesus with the people around us. While we're waiting for Christ's return, we're called to share the gospel with the people around us, to share the good news. And, you know, in the world we're living in today, they need to hear the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. While we're here waiting for Christ's return, we are to watch and to wait. We're to be expecting that it, his return will happen at any minute. Much like waiting for a much anticipated friend or relative who will be coming to visit. You know, one of the apps that I have on my phone um, that I use quite regularly is Find My Friends. And um, I have it set up or I have it, yes, have it set up so that I can see where my son and daughter-in-laws are, where my daughter and... Um, where where the family are, where the grandkids are, and and when and especially it's helpful when they're coming to see me. I can look on my phone. I'm going, oh, they're in Wildwood, they're in Inverness, they're in Homosassa, and we can I can see that they're getting close. We don't have that type of thing with the return of Jesus. We know he's coming, and we are told to watch. And to wait, expect his return, live as if he's coming within the next moment so that none of us are surprised. So let's look um, at the parable of for today. 
the parable of the ten minas. Um, it's in Luke chapter 19. We're going to begin with verse 11. Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. Before we do, let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now and ask his blessing on our time together. Father, we thank you so much for this day, for the beauty of this day, and for the opportunities that we're going to have to serve you. Lord, um, I pray that our ears, our eyes will be open today uh, so that we can see and hear what you have for us that we will understand the, the lesson that you would have for us today. Lord, not only is what we are what we receiving today something just for us, but Lord, we're to take what we gain and to share it with those that we come into contact with, that those that we meet at work, at the grocery store, when we're out in the park, Wherever we are, Lord, may we be faithful to the work that you have called us to. Now bless us in these moments, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So let's begin right now. Uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and hopefully uh, the verses will appear on your screen. Uh, this will be from the New International Version. Here we go. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. And then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money, in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. 
He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for those, as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. You know, I love that Jesus is a wonderful teacher and storyteller. All of, all of his stories that he tells relate to everyday life for his listeners. You know, in the past weeks, um, we have listened to Jesus talk about a farmer who was sowing seed and how that seed fell on, on soil of different conditions. Um, and, and the people who were listening to him would understand what he was talking about as he was trying to teach them. We've listened to Jesus talk about a group of, of young girls waiting with the bride for the bridegroom who would be coming soon. And, you know, they'd all attended and been a part of one of those wedding celebrations, remembered seeing uh, the bridesmaids with the bride. We've listened to Jesus talking about separating weeds from wheat. And, and we understand that process of, of separating weeds. Every story that Jesus relates, his listeners have witnessed, have been a part of. Or understand. They can relate to it. And in the story that Jesus tells today, in verse 12, he talks about a man of noble birth who travels to a distant city, a distant country, to have himself appointed king. Um, and he um, calls together ten servants and gives them money and trusts them with money that they are to um, increase and steward while he's gone. Now, some of his subjects, they hate him and they don't want him to be king. And so they send a delegation to, to make their feelings known. We don't want this man to be our king. The man, against their wishes, is made king anyway. And the people who are listening to Jesus tell this story in Jericho, they will recall a time in history when this very thing happened. Both Herod the Great and his son Archelaus went to Rome to receive the kingdom of Judea from Caesar. And in the case of Archelaus, the people hated him, and they sent a delegation to Rome to tell Caesar that they didn't want him to be their king. Now, Augustus compromised by allowing him to be a ruler, but did not give him the title of king. Um, he was made ruler on the premise that he would have to earn the title of king. Now, while he is the ruler there, he builds this beautiful palace for himself in Jericho. And that's where Jesus is teaching this lesson today. Jericho, it's about an 18-mile walk from Jerusalem. And so we have here another story Jesus is telling that is very relatable to everyone who's listening to him to this crowd and the disciples that Jesus is talking to. And in verse 13 of Jesus' story, the man gives 10 of his servants the same amount of money. In today's economy, um, or not in today's economy, but in that time, in that time, um, what they received was about 
three months wages. Now remember, a day's wage was only about four cents. Um, and then as, as the master goes on his trip, so he gives 10 servants the minas and he goes on his trip and he leaves them to use the money as they could. They're to put it to work, he said. They're to use it as, as they thought best. He didn't interfere with them in any way. He didn't stand over them, didn't give them a list of do's and don'ts. He left them entirely on their own. And the master wasn't what we would call today a micromanager. And he placed the same amount of trust in each of his servants. <laughs> I remember uh, reading um, while doing my studying for the Bible study that uh, someone said that the nicest thing about God is that he trusts us to do so much by ourselves. And that's what the master did here. Um, the master expected the servants to invest and to work with the money that they were given to see how much that they could um, increase. And since each was given a relatively small amount, as opposed to the amount um, given to the servants in the parable of the talents, um, and, and we're going to look at that a little later, the master, he's not looking to get rich. This is not a money-making scheme for him because it's not, as I said, a great deal of money. But what he's doing, his purpose is to test his servants to see which of them would be worthy of greater responsibility in his kingdom when he returns. And he does return in verse 15. And when he comes back, he calls his servants to him. They're to give an accounting. But in this passage, we don't hear from all ten. We only hear from three of the servants. And he wants to know, the, the master wants to learn of the gain, the interest, the increase, the fruit of their labors. And They've all got different yields. And the first servant comes. Look at that in verse six, verse 16. The first servant reports happily that he's increased his investment tenfold. And then the second uh, servant uh, approaches in verse 18. And again, he happily reports that he increased the investment fivefold. And a third servant comes in verse 20. And he gives back the mina that was given to him by his master. Hadn't made any interest. There was no gain. Um, what he did was he took what he was given, wrapped it up to keep it safe, and he buried it. Common practice in that day uh, for folks to hide those things, bury them. Uh, you'll remember uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about finding a pearl of great price or and the man who found that hidden treasure. Well, here the servant took and he buried the mina and he returns it intact just as he received it to his master. The first two servants their reward isn't a monetary reward. In verse 17 and verse 19, they're rewarded with greater responsibility that's proportionate to their demonstrated faithfulness. Not necessarily their fruitfulness. God doesn't call us to be fruitful. He calls us to be faithful. They were faithful, he says, in a very small thing, and their faithfulness shows that they're able to take on more responsibility. And so he says, here, take these 10 cities. You'll be in charge. I'll be in, uh, you, you'll answer to me, but 
take charge of these 10 cities. You take these five cities. You can have responsibility for them. You'll answer to me, but take these five cities. There's there's a lesson implied here that's taught in other passages of Scripture, that the power of the gospel is in the message itself. It's not in the skill of the messenger. The masters didn't say, or the service didn't say, oh, master, my great business skill has multiplied the, the, to, and, and given, now increased to 10 minus because of me. What they said in verse 16 and what it, and in verse 18, your minus have made 10 more. Your minus master have made five more. The power was in the minus, not in the servants. The power of the gospel isn't in the power of a slick delivery, but rather God's power working through his word. He is entrusted to us a responsibility, and he asks us to be faithful in carrying it out. We need to be faithful in planting the seed and then allowing God to do the work. And so for this third servant, the master, and and look at verse 22, he faults that third servant for not even taking the simplest and, and most conservative steps to get some increase on the money by depositing it with a banker. Man, you know... (laughs) Have you looked at savings deposit rates <laughs> now compared to 1960? And I thought they were small in 1960. The master faults the servant for not even doing the simplest thing. Um, the, 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 that servant wasn't just being lazy but he deliberately did nothing for the benefit of the master. And and he defends his behavior in verse 21. Um, He says, Master, I know that you're a hard man. He says, I fear, I'm afraid of you, master. And and he says, you're a hard man. Um, You... You reap a harvest where you haven't planted. And he tries to paint a negative picture of the character of his master. But you know, the listeners of his story is going, wait a minute, this isn't a hard man. That's not true. Because verse 17, verse 19 He gave one servant 10 cities, another servant five cities. That's not being hard. You know, it seems to me that the third servant didn't really know his master. By calling him a harsh man, when in reality, he's very generous. He was generous to the first two servants. And in verse 24, the master takes the mina from that third servant and gives it to the man who earned two. And so when he does that, some question his action in verse 25. And maybe they're questioning how fair this is or the need of the first servant? Well, it's not fair. He already has 10. He already has 10. Why does he need one more? But the master is distributing his gifts 
on the basis of faithfulness and capability, not on fairness or need. And and when the those are with the master question what he's done, he explains in verse 26, to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who doesn't have, even what he does have shall be taken away. The one who has been faithful will have more opportunity for faithfulness. The one who has been unfaithful will be stripped of his responsibilities. Luke mentions in the first verse of this chapter, as I said, that Jesus is in Jericho and that he's just passing through. He's not there for an extended period of time. As I said, he's, in, he's headed to Jerusalem. And there he will be crowned king. As he's riding into Jerusalem, we'll hear the people shout in Luke 19 and 38, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. He would be their king. But soon, Jesus will be rejected by his people. And this identifies Jesus as the man of noble birth in the parable. And the crowd shouting, crucify him in Luke 23, 21, are the people in the parable who oppose the nobleman's assignment. And this parable warns us that if that we that each of us have to decide if Jesus is indeed God's appointed king. And we need to be prepared to live with the consequences of our decisions, whether to serve him or to oppose him. The, the servants which the master charges with the, with the task represent the followers of Jesus. You and me, we're the servants. The Lord has given us a valuable, important commission, and we have to be faithful to serve him until he returns. And when he does return, Jesus will return will determine the faithfulness of his, of his servants. Paul wrote um, to his readers in Rome that one day that each of us are going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of our work and our faithfulness. Right now, there is a lot of work to be done, and we are to use what God has given us for his glory, knowing that we will be rewarded for our work, just as the three servants were rewarded or received their pay. You know, one commentator uh, wrote, and I share this with you, the third servant represents people who are related to the master in that they're associated with the community 
and have responsibility in it. But their attitude shows that they don't see God as gracious and that they haven't really trusted him. Such people are left with nothing at the judgment. They're sent to outer darkness because they never really trusted or knew God. The, the third servant, I think, represents those in the church who know the gospel and they should believe it, but they're indifferent. They're unconcerned about the master's purpose in the kingdom. So they're not using the opportunities that he's given to them to further his kingdom. They're living for themselves and they're making excuses as to why the job is not being done. This parable makes explicit that citizens of God's kingdom are responsible to work towards God's goals and purposes. The point is that acknowledging Jesus as king requires working towards his purposes in whatever field of work we find ourselves. Wherever we are, we are working for the master. Just popped into my head, all my work is for the master. He alone, he alone is all my heart's desire. Oh, that he would find me faithful. That's what we're talking about here. And we can also learn that the servant's <coughs> service here was a test and a, and a, um, a preparation for their future service in the kingdom. Now, I don't know exactly what's going to happen when we get to heaven, but I think that these days, just like the master who tested his servants to see if they would be faithful in a little thing, their performance of their duties in that little thing was preparing them to graduate from servants to rulers, still under the master. I don't know that I'm going to be sitting on some cloud up in heaven. Nothing to do. No, I don't think so. I think the Lord is preparing meaningful, satisfying activity for us in his kingdom for all eternity. For a moment, let's, let's look at... Uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's, let me read these verses to you, 14 to 30. Okay? Matthew 25, beginning with verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. 
The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not gathered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The, the parable of the ten minas is similar to the parable of the talent. There are some who think that they are the same story, <clears throat> but there are enough differences to determine that they are indeed two different parables. The parable of the Minas was told um, in Jericho, um, while the parable of the talents was told later on the Mount of Olives. Um, the audience for the parables um, for the Minas was a, was a large crowd, um, while the audience for the parable of the talents was just the disciples by themselves. Um, and the um, parable of the Minas, it deals with uh, two groups of people, the servants and the enemies of the master. Um, while the parable of the talents deals only with the servants. Um, in the parable of the, of the minas, each servant receives the same amount, while in the parable of the talents, each servant receives a different amount. And, and you know what? Just as a note, um, talents was a much larger amount um, than minas. Um, the returns are different. Um, in the parable of the minas, the servants uh, report tenfold and fivefold. Um, and while in the uh, parable of the talents, the servants doubled um, their investment. 
And in the parable of the, the minas, the servants received identical gifts. Um, it, and it, they're different in, in the parable of the talents. Um, but there are plenty of similarities in these two parables uh, that I think are worth noting. In both parables, the servants are entrusted a portion of the master's wealth. And, and like in the parable of the minas, the servants in the parable of the talents, they're expected to do something. It wasn't that they were just to take it and to keep it but they were expected to work, to do something. And, and in both of the parables, um, we see that, that, that faithful work is rewarded and that it's not the size of what we're given that's important, but it's what we do with it. And if we don't use what God has given to us, we'll lose it. The reward of work well done is greater tasks and responsibility, greater trust. You know, from the beginning of our Bible studies, I, I've said that we should ask ourselves the question, what does this mean to me? What is God saying to me through this story? I believe that what we have heard today is an excellent opportunity for us to analyze the work that we're doing for God. Are there things that might be keeping us at times from being a faithful servant? Have we lost focus? Might we be guilty of a lack of planning, perhaps even a fear of failure? Maybe it is that other commitments seem more important than what God has asked us to do. There's no such thing as standing still in the Christian life. We either get more or we lose what we have. We either advance to greater heights or we slip back. I pray that on that day, when we stand before our master, we'll hear, hear him say to each of us, well done, my good servant, enter your master's happiness. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for what we have heard today. Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful. There are so many things in the world today that would try to steal us away from the work that you have called us to do. Even in the last weeks, Lord, there have been fears that may have taken our focus off of what is important. You have called us to work, Lord, and to be faithful. Oh, I pray that we would be faithful. And as the writer has said, that we would turn our eyes upon Jesus. 
And Lord, that your work, the work that you have called us to, would be our focus, would be our goal, would be our will, our desire. Bless us, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that we would not only be hearers of the word we have heard today. May we apply these things to our lives and take them out and share them with those that we meet that we would be your messengers. Lord, that our hands would be your hands, that our mouth would be your mouth, that our feet would be your feet, carrying the gospel message to those who need to hear it. Yes, Lord, may we hear you say, well done, my good sir. And we pray all of this in your holy name. Amen. Now, I look forward to um, being with you um, on Sunday uh, when we will meet here together for our worship. Um, we'll let you know that uh, Major Linda and I will be a little late getting started on our social distance visits on tomorrow. Uh, we have some things that need to be done here at the office, um, and so we probably won't get started until about 9 30, 10 o'clock tomorrow. But we will see you tomorrow, and then we'll look forward to worshiping together here on Facebook Live. God bless you.